Hello everyone, welcome to this lecture on historical methods using archival resources. This lecture is part of your paper on communication research. In the introduction, in this module, you will learn about the historical method. Before we discuss this method, it is important to understand a little bit about what history is. The common understanding of the word history is something related to the past. The past can be some events that had taken place in a person's life, in an organization, community, corporations or any other institution. Therefore, the historical method involves studying, explaining and understanding the events that happened in the past. This method attempts to systematically recapture the complex nuances, the people, meanings, events and even ideas of the past that have influenced and shaped the present. Now the question is why would someone delve into the past and what could be the reasons in doing so? Now, some of the scholars like Leuvenberg have mentioned various reasons that would serve as an answer to this, these, some of these questions. These are to uncover the unknown, to answer particular questions, to seek implications or relationships of events from the past and their connections with the present, to assess past activities and accomplishments of individuals, agencies or institutions and to generally aid in our understanding of human culture. One important concern for a historian investigating the past is to set a time frame for the collection of archival evidences. In this sense, then, there can be a varied number of pasts and historians may differ from each other in their views of the past. However, bringing in a new past depends on how a historian engages in digging for it. The process of looking by one and relooking by others is called revisionism. Historical research chronologically unfolds, evaluates and combines the archival evidences to ascertain the facts and arrive at a certain conclusions about the past. Since it involves studying archives, the method is also called archival research. Archival research entails a series of actions intended to investigate the documents and other historical evidences created during a certain period in time during the past. These past resources are not only utilized by historians but also by scholars from different streams to supplement their research. The common examples of archives are digitized data, emails, digital storage devices, national archives, official reports, and so on. The origins of the historical method can be traced from the works of 18th century British theologian, that is Joseph Priestley, who employed historical method in studying Christian scriptures where he found that the churches were corrupt. The methods is now used in almost all disciplines to trace the origin, growth, development, changes and so on of a person, an event, a monument, an organization and so on. Now historical method in communication research we refer the uses of historical uh, method in media and communication studies is still in its infancy. The reason is that communication media are to a large extent 
as the name declares, the carriers rather than the creators of the cause and effects historians normally attend to. Another scholar argues that communication practices have been studied for many centuries, although they have not always been investigated as part of communication studies. Generally, there are two approaches to understanding the history of media and communication. The first approach uh, concern with the history of communication involving communicative practices through some means that is the medium. The historical method can be used in communication studies in broadly in three different ways. That is one, the macro history of communication which represents the most common view about the history of communication. Through macro history, a researcher unfolds the individual human nature and traces the progress of an institution and deconstructs the process of modernizing and so on. Two, the history proper of communication, which is rarely used in communication research. This method unfolds media relationship with cultural, political, economic or social history and tries to answer how do changes in communication influence these aspects and how is communication influenced by them. In other words, history proper of communication focuses on what communication tells us about society and what society tells us about communication and three, the institutional history of communication through which a researcher chronologically traces the growth and development of media institutions in terms of language, contents or programs, actors involved and so on. Through this method, the researcher tries to explore how external forces influence or affect the institution. One common example of this sort would be exploring the expansion of television using various reports, investigating the underlying factors forcing expansion, what led to the enactment of certain laws regulating television and so on. The second approach is relatively young and involves history of media such as institutional history or biographical history. While institutional history involves tracing the growth and development of a media institution, the biographical history involves the studying the structural changes within a media institution. Now, historical research can be conducted at two levels, the micro level and the macro level. Scholars or historians involved in conducting research using historical method might try to investigate either a single media institution or media at national or global level. In other words, researchers might be interested in undertaking research focusing either on a selective set of people or events within an institution or focusing broadly on the entire institution, society or country. Thus, there are two ways of conducting research using historical method depending upon what is in focus. Narrower the focus is a micro history research and broader focus is a macro history research. As mentioned earlier, historical research utilizes various sources for the collection of data archival resources to collect data. Now, what are these sources will be discussed in the following section, in, in the following section. In the third section, we'll be discussing about sources of data collection but before we delve into the sources of data collection, let us understand 
what data is and what is meant by data collection. Data comprises unrefined information such as archival and other written documents through which researchers in general and historians in particular re reach certain conclusions. Now data collection on the other hand is a process of assembling the unrefined information for analysis and interpretation. In this method, the researcher engages only with the information that is existent. However, collecting this information is a difficult task because these can be scattered over a larger geographical area which requires an extensive travel sometimes to distant places. Also identifying genuine data for analysis and interpretation is a prerequisite for historical research to produce a good research work. Researchers consider this data as witnesses in a trial. They utilize this historical data to recreate history but in doing so they face a major challenge, the challenge of authenticity. Historical data can exist as official reports, public records, ministry documents, newspaper editorials and stories, essays, folklores, films, photos, diaries, your letters, artifacts, biographies, autobiographies or even interview records. These forms of data can be categorized into different sources. However, scholars differ in their categorization of these data forms. Some scholars divide it into primary and secondary sources only, while others, these forms, that is primary and secondary and tertiary. Now, while referring to the primary sources, we can say that primary sources refer to the first hand account of events either created during the time of its occurrence or at some later time period reflecting individual viewpoint of a partic participant or observer. These sources comprise written text either published or unpublished concerning the events, people or situations recorded personally by the writer at the time these events occurred because the writer is a witness to these written texts therefore such documents are considered original and authenticate authentic the common examples of primary sources that is include court records letters photographs recording diaries journals autobiographies notes and so on all these sources are usually produced by either the person involved in it or by an eyewitness to the event such as observer or researcher. Now secondary sources include those sources which provide an oral or written demonstration of the events regardless of being witness to these events. These sources are created by others to provide a second-hand account of certain events. Common examples of secondary sources include textbooks, encyclopedia, oral histories, newspaper stories and so on. These sources are not only easily accessible but can easily be defined and understood. While planning to collect secondary data, researcher has to keep in mind two important considerations. The first is that a researcher has to make sure that the secondary data exists. Now after the confirmation of the data being existent, the researcher has to get access to the existing data. Using secondary or existing data is advantageous in the sense that it incurs less expenditure and is also time saving which differentiates it from the collecting primary data. 
Now, while referring to the tertiary sources of data, that includes a blend of primary and secondary sources of information available in some form of anthology format. Also, we can see it in Lunenberg's writings. Uh, the, uh, the, common tertiary, uh, the common tertiary sources of data include bibliographies, encyclopedias, or any other item used primarily to locate primary or secondary data. Tertiary sources of data can supplement the context of your study, but these sources are seldom considered authentic or, authentic, or it can be authenticated. Research ethics in historical method while coming to part four, we can discuss that ethics are the norms or the codes that govern and guide the process of research right from the start until the findings are published. Ethics is an important issue to take into consideration whether the researcher is dealing with the research on people or in archival data. In order to validate the findings of the study, the researcher has to maintain the ethical veracity in terms of the originality of findings certain ethical issues in historical research include honesty in the work, plagiarism and acknowledgement, citation and interpretation. The first is honesty in the work. Researchers in every field are always under an obligation to honestly carry out the research. Honesty means being fair in the collection of data, proper acknowledgement of the quotes or intellectual ideas coming up with results based on truth and so on. The second is plagiarism. The writings, reports or findings of historical research are the sole property of individual researcher who conducted the study and therefore anything that is ideas, text or graphics borrowed from some source without acknowledging the source amounts to plagiarism. As mentioned earlier, researchers are always under obligation to follow ethics throughout the process of researching. Breaching ethical codes are the worst offense against honesty. Also, the non-acknowledgement of collaborators in the work equally amounts to the violation of research ethics. The third is citation. Citation in general means referencing the quoted or unquoted text in your writings borrowed from the works of others. Citation allows the researcher to acknowledge the contribution of others in his own work. Different sources can be used for citation in a research study such as articles, manuscripts, newspapers, magazines, website or electronic resources, interviews or any graphical content. The last is interpretation. During the process of analyzing and interpreting the data collected for historical research, the researcher is mobilized to ensure that facts are being presented and shun from data misinterpretation while interpretation does not only include analyzing the data but also involves sharing the findings. Therefore, the findings of a research study should be published in a responsible manner so as to reach to the larger masses. Now, while evaluating historical data, we would refer that the data collected in historical research which includes primary, secondary and tertiary types can be evaluated through broadly two ways of external and internal evaluations. One is external, while referring to the external evaluation, I mean that is mostly concerned with the external characteristics of the data. That is, external evaluation allows a researcher to test the legitimacy of the source and the data collected. This means that the historical evidence collected 
for analysis and interpretation is put to test to clarify its authenticity, be it primary, secondary or tertiary data. Thus, theoretically, external evaluation serves the functions of ascertaining the reality of data. The process is ascertaining the authenticity, validity or legitimacy of historical data involved signatures on the evidences, patterns of writing, date inscribed or mentioned in the evidence and so on. This way of evaluation requires researcher to find out who created the evidence at what point in time geographically where and why was the evidence produced. The other is internal evaluation through which the accuracy of the data is examined. This form of evaluation involves analyzing text, signs, symbols, etc. and attaching meaning to them. This way of evaluation tries to find meanings given to the evidences. The idea or ideas underlying the creation of evidences, the message for public or any other innovative way through which a researcher can extract multiple meanings from these evidences. Reporting the findings, now this is the last, one of the last stages would be that reporting the finding is not an easy task. It involves the highest level of scholarship. Generally, there is no standard format of writing historical research. However, there are certain significant ways that guide the writing of historical research. One historical fact can be presented as a response to the research questions. Research questions can either comprise one chapter or the research questions lay the base for the structure of your historical account. In doing so, the researcher had to present the events or various episodes of an event in a chronological order and through different sections or chapters. The final outcome can be descriptive, narrative, explanatory or critical. Descriptive history involves presenting an account of the things as they appear. However, the descriptive report, whether concerning people, places, institutions or any other entity, must be vibrant to fascinate the readers. Narrative histories involved telling stories about what happened. In narrative writings, the events are presented in a systematic order, chronologically. However, writing narratives does not only involve presenting the facts in a systematic manner, but the narratives should end up with some stimulating results. Explanatory history involves explaining background of an institution or an event reasons behind the occurrence of these events, why are these events significant and so on. Explanatory history is always used with other modes of writing history. For example, a narrative on the de demonetization should also explain why it happened. The last is critical history, that is historian always use an argument to challenge the previously held views about some event or institution. In critical history, the writers not only explain their own ideas or thoughts, but nullify the existing uh, thoughts previously held. So now we can conclude. So in terms of summary, I would like to submit by saying that in this module, you have learned about the historical method its genesis and its usage in the communication studies. This module provides an insight into various forms of data that researchers rely on in presenting historical accounts. However, every form of research, whether in communication studies 
or in any other branch of social science, there are certain courts and principles that guide the research process throughout. These are the ethical considerations which are clearly illustrated in this module. The module also informs about the ways evaluation of the historical data is done and the modes of presenting or writing the historical accounts. I hope you enjoy the lecture. Thank you.